Um, the, the topic is about the uh, history of um, Morocco's Jewish community. Um, until today, until you know, modern times, Morocco's Jewish community is um, the largest Jewish community in the Muslim world and in many respects um, the most uh, you know, um, profitable, successful, etc., etc., etc. What many people uh, don't realize is first how complex and how rich um, in diversity Morocco's Jewish community is, but also how, um, how long it's been there. So um, the Jewish community in Morocco has been around since antiquity and essentially um, basically since um, 2,500 years ago there has been a Jewish community of some sort in Morocco. Um, originally uh, in Carthaginian times, um, if anybody watching is from Tunis, um, the, the Carthaginian Empire which you know, had uh, Carthage as its capital, um, the Tunisian, uh, Carthaginian Empire, rather, um, was, uh, you know, a community which connected the entire Mediterranean and um, the first Jewish settlers um, from, from Carthaginian times uh, settled in Morocco with, you know, the initial... Um, the initial uh, relationship between them and the Carthaginians being one that was linguistic. Um, 1,500 years before the Arab conquest of Morocco, there was a vibrant Jewish community. Um, the Hebrew language and the Aramaic language spoken by, by, many, um, by many Jews at the time um, was very close to the Punic language of the Carthaginians. And this lent itself to the Hebrews, or essentially the Jewish people at the time, being um, all over the Mediterranean um, within the Carthaginian Empire, acting as traders. Um, this concept of Mediter trans-Mediterranean trade is very important, especially um, when we look at the later iterations of the, uh, of the Jewish community within Morocco. So you first have this community, um, essentially around the Mediterranean, and then there's also um, a very vibrant, very... Uh, uh, old uh, Jewish community amongst Morocco's Berber population. Um, so you have tribes in the Atlas, Berber by ethnicity, but um, Jewish in religion. Um, they become very strong um, communities, a lot of them benefiting from what they call the Trans-Saharan trade. So trade coming from Sudan west to Morocco, and trade also going from the Mediterranean south to the Niger River Delta to Timbuktu, etc., etc., etc. That community is then supplemented a third time by uh, Jewish people who come as refugees to Morocco following the fall of the Roman Empire. So Jews that had done previously very well in the Roman Empire were then sent um, by virtue of persecution by the Visigoths in Spain um, across the Mediterranean um, uh, in search of peace and um, freedom from persecution. And you have what a third um, intake of, of, of a Jewish community to Morocco, which is, um, comes, comes essentially from Spain um, during the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, the real watershed moment is um, during the establishment of the city of Fez in 808, um, when uh, Morocco, um, basically uh, the Arab conquest of Morocco is complete. And um, the establishment of the city of Fez sees also the eventual establishment of a synagogue and a very prominent Jewish community um, across what is now Morocco, Spain, and uh, Portugal. People often um, forget to tie the three territories together. Uh, early um, medieval, dark age and early medieval Morocco was not just territorial Morocco that you see today, but also the Iberian Peninsula and the Balearic Islands. Um, during that time, uh, it's almost an, uh, a, a beautiful marriage of civilizations, um, the uh, Judeo-Islamic and the Christian 
uh, a lot of that taking place in what is now modern-day southern Spain. Uh, Jews grow to um, very, very prominent positions within the various um, Andalusi empires. And um, what we see is a, a development of a Jewish community, especially through um, the, pr the prism of um, the Sephardic tradition, almost um, a Jewish aristocracy developing in southern Spain, which exercises a lot of clout and has a lot of respect in northern Morocco. Um, this is then, uh, you know, goes through various uh, moments. We have incredible um, archive material from the time of Jewish uh, figures, uh, physicians, philosophers, historians, etc., who, um, you know, really lead the way in, in, in Muslim Spain. And then um, separately, we also have uh, what we have now, um, the, the Reconquista in Spain, where the Christian rulers, you know, basically have enough of uh, Muslim overlordship. And essentially, they, um, they uh, you know, demand the either forced conversion or the expulsion of Spain's Muslims and Jews. Um, Joe, I see you've just joined. I'm just uh, a, a bit further down the historical path, but I hope you can catch up. And then um, following the Reconquista, as Spain's Christian monarchs take more and more land in Spain, it becomes increasingly more difficult for um, Judaism and Islam to be practiced within Spain, within, within the Iberian Peninsula. Um, during this time, tapas is developed as, you know, a... Uh, uh, a pork-centric um, dish, which is designed to, you know, flush out any Muslims and Jews amongst the Spanish population that may be hiding their religion, so that they can, um, so that they can, uh, you know, um, live amongst the the, the Spaniards freely. Um, and then, as things get worse, um, you have increasingly, um, you know, you have increasing migration of uh, Iberian Jews along with their Muslim. Um, counterparts over the Mediterranean back to Morocco. At the same time, in the early medieval period in Morocco, during the Morabid period, you have some very prominent um, Jewish ministers, advisors, and top civil servants um, across, across uh, Morocco, especially centred around Fez, who do incredibly well and are given um, some very important mandates by the um, Morabid rulers at the time, Mandates which um, allow them to uh, conduct business and, importantly, act as emissaries for the Sultan. Um, for those of you who, who heard um, previous lectures of mine, you will know that um, Morocco suffered from frequent periods of civil strife uh, during moments of succession. Uh, between Sultan and Sultan, there were moments of, of complete chaos. And um, what we had is um, several prominent um, Jewish uh, people during the Morabit period. And that, of course, the, the, the Morabit held territory in northwest Africa and Spain. And then uh, as the Morabit um, dynasty, uh, you know, um, as their star fades, you have the rise of the Muahideen, or in English, the al Mohad dynasty. And... Um, what you have in Morocco, every single time a dynasty supplants another, you have a, um, a, a religious fanatical movement which is designed to almost clean up the religion, to reinstate holy practice on the premise that the previous dynasty has decayed and can no longer you know, protect, um, protect religious uh, teaching and religious guidance and practice. So the Murabitin are very quickly um, then replaced by the Muwahideen, the al Mohads, and what we see is they having a um, uh, them having a more rigorous uh, implementation of the jizya tax. Now, jizya in Islamic societies, following the Pact of Omar and the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem, um, is a concept that Jews and Christians, being you know um, holy people in the Islamic context. Um, are were, were, were allowed to live under the protection of um, under the protection of uh, Jewish uh, under the protection of, 
of Muslim overlords um, on the proviso that they respected uh, Muslim overlordship and on the, on the side of the ruler that they were protected from persecution. And you have the development of the Moroccan Malah. Now the Malah system is the, um, is the Jewish quarter in every major town or city in Morocco. And essentially you have a Malah, a Jewish quarter, always attached to um, the Sultan's premises. For example, the, um, for those of you from Rabat or, or Casablanca watching today, you will know that the Dirb Yahudi, the, the Hay Yahudi, is always next to, um, is always next to the, 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 the Sultan or, or where central authority was. Now the Muwahideen, they implement jizya more rig rigorously and Jewish people are forced to pay. And um, that comes at the same time um, with uh, increasing arrivals um, of Jewish uh, emigres from Spain. The Reconquista becomes so um, uh, incredibly, um, becomes so incredibly, uh, uh, you know, devastating that you simply cannot practice Judaism in, in, in Spain no longer. And um, in 1340, the Battle of, Salgado, of, of, of Salado, that's the last time that any Moroccan dynasty makes an attempt on Iberian territory, and it's a doomed attempt, and that leads to an almost um, instantaneous further migration of Jewish people from southern Spain to Morocco. Remember, many of them had family in Morocco, many of them followed rabbinical um, uh, institutions in Morocco. Morocco was um, almost the center of Judaic tradition in that part of the world at that time. Um, as they leave, uh, there are, you know, under the Muwahideen, um, despite things becoming more difficult for Jewish people, um, there are also um, moments of um, Jewish people um, reaching some very, very important positions within the Moroccan state. And the more that arrive from Spain, the more that they enrich Moroccan society. Uh, leading Jews from Andalusia, uh, a lot of them um, educated, a lot of them um, philosophers, uh, physicians, mathematicians, uh, literarians. They um, essentially enrich Moroccan society. And what you have is a Sephardic aristocracy transplanting itself from southern Spain to Morocco, supplementing, for those who have just joined, the existing Berber Jewish community and the existing Jewish community that's existed since Carthaginian times. Um, that Jewish community uh, centers itself around fairs. And interestingly, not until um, the 19th century do you see marriage between the three main Jewish communities of Morocco. They are separate, independent communities, um, you know, with various issues amongst each other, though this Sephardic aristocracy elite manages to supplant itself. Um, the, the Middle Ages then see an interesting time. Uh, as, as the jizya becomes harder for, make, makes it harder for Jewish businessmen to operate, um, a lot of them choose to convert. So a lot of, you know, um, families um, who, you know, today are, are you know, functioning, uh, you know, normal Muslim families in, in Morocco are originally Jewish um, converts. Families such as uh, Kabbaj, Dukali, uh, who else? Um, Meymaran, Toledano, uh, Ben Shakron. These are all uh, Moroccan, uh, Moroccans today of Jewish extraction who converted during the, the, the Middle Ages so as to improve their, their, their business prospects. Um, and what you have is um, a growing community around the Sultan, any one Sultan, and um, rising to some really important positions. Um, as the Spanish and um, as the Spanish and the Portuguese international empires grow, they establish trading posts uh, along the Atlantic uh, on Morocco's coasts, and funnily enough, the same Moroccan Jews who were forced to leave Spain and Portugal become the chief interlocutors 
between um, the Moroccan state and the new empires. Um, what you have then is you have um, the Sultan almost charging these uh, these Jewish um, businessmen along the Atlantic coast and and giving them the chief uh, uh, you know um, authorization so as to conduct um, so as to conduct uh, business on behalf of the Sultan. You have this um, the, the, the most prominent of these is uh, you have um, Ibn Ibn Malka who is the last uh, who is the last you know the greatest Moroccan medieval, philosopher who is Jewish. You have um, so many names. Uh, I'll just get you a few. I took them down earlier for you. Um, I'll get back to that. You have so many names um, of, of prominent Jewish businessmen who, who are, uh, who are you know, uh, the Sultan's chief uh, interlocutors with the Spanish and the Portuguese. And then perhaps the most prominent one of that time is uh, Samuel Palash, who became, you know, the Sultan's ambassador to the Netherlands. Um, for the historians amongst you, you will know that the Netherlands was an incredibly important trading power in the late 17th, early 18th century. And um, the 1610 Morocco, Moroccan-Dutch Treaty of um, Friendship um, and Trade Relations was chiefly um, administered by Samuel Palach, who actually died in the Netherlands and is buried there. His family are an incredible example of um, successful Jewish diaspora, um, the kind of uh, Mediterranean, cross trans Mediterranean Jewish family that you know had people in in Genoa, people in uh, uh, southern Spain, people in Istanbul, and actually Samuel Palash's family later go on to become um, Pashalar uh, in the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople. Um, uh, second generation Jews um, from Moroccan Essaouira uh, write uh, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you know, there's there's so many very prominent people. Um, you've got a British Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, the first, um, the first uh, British Prime Minister of Jewish origin, had uh, Moroccan roots. You have some really important um, um, intellectual individuals who, um, who their origins are in Morocco. And then in this context of the Ibn Ma'allam, Ibn Muhajir, Ibn um, Farusal, all of these leading Jewish um, academics, etc., you also have a, 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 a system that, 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 that takes place where um, the modern Moroccan state has some very um, interesting Jewish or almost Hebraic origins. And that leads me to um, the 17th century. And um, there are several um, myths, as it were, that um, Moulay Rashid, the, the, the first Alaw uh, Alawite ruler, the, the dynasty that rules Morocco today, um, either worked alongside or removed um, the richest man in Morocco at the time, uh, a certain Ibn Mish'al, uh, at least the richest man in eastern Morocco. Historical res um, sources refer to him as a Jewish prince or a Jewish king. And um, uh, either Moulay Rashid removes him or supplants him or takes a loan from him. We're not sure. But there is this almost um, Hebraic genesis of the Moroccan state. Of course, the modern flag of Morocco is the Seal of Solomon. Uh, the Moroccan kings at the time took a lot of their political philosophy from the biblical King Solomon. And um, there is um, an almost um, symbiotic relationship that develops between the Mahzen and uh, the, um, the, the Jewish community in Morocco. For those of you that haven't heard me speak before, the Mahzen is the term used to, is the, is the term used to, to describe the Moroccan political and military establishment. It's also the origin of the word uh, magazine, interestingly, in English. Uh, it moved um, from, from Arabic to Italian through to, um, through to English, probably during the Crusades at Malta. Um, so the Mahzen uh, is able to then um, utilise this intelligent, hardworking, international Jewish community um, at its disposal. And this is um, supplemented by... Um, various events which increase this practice. So what we have is we have um, the Moroccan Sultan, 
always having to be in a perpetual state of jihad so as to legitimize his rule. And what you have is um, the, the sultan being in a position where pirates off the coast of Morocco, state-sanctioned pirates in uh, the northern Atlantic, the Mediterranean, raise taxes for the sultan, take captives for the sultan, for the sultan to then have political leverage with the European uh, powers. Now, what this means is uh, uh, the um, European powers are constantly trying to negotiate with Morocco. What it means is that there is um, a relationship that, 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 that um, takes place where the Moroccan state gets revenue from piracy, which is incredibly important. And the men sent to, um, to uh, recuperate this... Um, this, uh, what's the word, uh, to, to, to fix these relationships diplomatically are often Jewish diplomats. And um, to that end, we have some incredibly, incredibly memorable moments um, whereby uh, the, 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 the Sultan has put great trust into the Jewish community. Amongst them are um, Moses and Joseph Maimaran during the reign of Mulay Ismail. And... Um, Tolidano, uh, the um, ambassador to the Netherlands and the ambassador to King Philip of Spain. The, the, um, the Tolidano mission to King Philip is incredibly telling of the relationship between the Sultan and the and Moroccan Jewish community. Um, Tolidano was refused to disembark on the Moroccan coast upon arrival in Spain under fear that his Judaism would contaminate or somehow disrupt the um, Catholicism of newly reconquered Spain. This news is returned to the greatest of Morocco's monarchs, Sultan Mulay Ismail, and he writes a punishing letter, which I actually have with me here, to King Philip of Spain, in which he says, to the tyrant Philip, King of Castile, Leon, Aragon, um, Andalusia, Mexico, and India. Shows you how well informed the Moroccan Sultan was at the time. Uh, I'm writing basically due to the refusal of my Jewish servant, um, uh, Tolidano, to arrive in your country. He says, um, I'm not sure why you wouldn't let him disembark, and I'm not sure what faith it is that you practice that you are worried that one Jew will um, somehow disrupt your religious uh, practice in your country, and he goes on to say, I, you know, as the great Sharif of Morocco, condone churches and priests and the idolatry that resides within them because I'm a tolerant man. It's a sign of my great kingship. I think by the same virtue, you can allow my Jewish ambassador to disembark, and I will return you a favor in kind. This is very important. But then the Sultan goes on to say, I shall not return a favour beyond the favour that you gave me, but I shall return a favour that is fitting. This is also continued in the Netherlands. Um, Morocco's Jewish ambassadors face anti-Semitism in the Netherlands. And what you have then is um, you have uh, entire communities um, of, of Jewish, communi of, of Jewish um, Moroccans across the Mediterranean in Europe doing the Sultan's bidding and um, importantly, acting as his businessman. Um, this, is, uh, this develops as piracy comes to an end. Um, so throughout the early modern period, Barbary pirates from Algiers, um, Morocco, um, Tunis, uh, as you know, Algeria and Tunisia were not countries at the time, but, but pirates from those countries um, were, you know, uh, taking uh, Europeans captive and, and, you know, getting a, a huge amount of money um, with, with, through ransom. And uh, what happens is, following the British bombardment of, Tangi of, of Algiers, the Barbary piracy basically comes to an end. And what you have is um, a whole uh, transformation in the European-North African relationship. It's transformed altogether. And um, because of the taxes lost by the sultans of Morocco 
through um, the uh, conclusion of Barbary piracy on the Mediterranean. What you then have is you have um, a, a series of um, business-related uh, business um, policy decisions that are taken so as to you know, uh, enrich the Mahzan and to make sure that it has a steady supply of revenue. And um, by the 18th century, all of the foreign trade that's taking place in Morocco, by and large, is administered by Moroccan Jews. And um, a handful of Jewish merchants in Morocco's key ports, which were um, Al Sawera, Al Jadida, um, uh, Casablanca, Mehdia, Sla, Tanja, um, in all these key ports, you have Moroccan um, Jewish community of, of businessmen there. And um, what happens then is we have um, quasi monopolies that are um, established in these ports. You have monopolies for henna, for tobacco, for sulfur, for iron, for firearms, which are run by the Moroccan Jewish community. Now, the religious element in this is very important. The Sultan of Morocco um, was not only king, but also, in some respects, the chief religious figure within Morocco at the time. And he had to justify his usage of Jewish businessmen under the pretext that Muslim businessmen could not be in contact with, um, with, with non-Muslims, with, with Christian businessmen. So... He, the various sultans keep the ulama happy with that kind of um, reasoning. However, at the same time, they build this dependent relationship upon, upon the Jewish community. Now, what happens then is, um, what happens then is you have a, uh, a period of um, some very, very um, important um, Jewish businessmen building uh, monopolies um, through this patrimonial relationship that they have with the sultan. For example, you have a um, you have a a relationship in Asawera whereby only four of the twenty key shipping families in Asawera are Muslim. The the the, uh, the 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 rest of the of the shipping families in Asawera are completely Jewish. However, they are constantly in a in a indebted to the Mahzen, joining the two together. So Morocco's Jewish community owe the Sultan debt perpetually, but the Sultan also needs the Jewish community to do Morocco's foreign international trade. And the Sultan needs the foreign international trade and has justified that with the ulama. Why? So that he can fund jihad. Jihad in his context being maintaining a fitna-free, a sedition-free environment where the rule of Islam is supreme in a very, very... Um, in a very, very uh, complicated uh, political environment. Um, as the European powers grow, and as um, imperialism becomes more um, prominent, the Mahzen is forced into several international agreements which change the way trade is done. Previously, especially after the um, conclusion of piracy, the Mahzen was extracting very, very important um, international um, revenue through um, customs and excise. Huge uh, taxes were put on foreign, uh, on foreign, um, on foreign goods, and separately, um, the Jewish community that they had in each port was working to essentially, um, uh, you know, do the business of the Sultan. And um, it's not too dissimilar to the situation in Europe at the time. In the Middle Ages, you have, um, in, uh, at, some, at some points, you have a, uh, what's the word? Um, you, have a, you have these relationships why, whereby serfs of the chamber, or what several Moroccans, Moroccan sultans call in their letters, uh, Sultan Abdurrahman in 1857 wrote of our Jews, Yehudana, and um, you have this very, very um, close relationship between the Mahzen and the Jewish community um, building. Um, and this officially uh, becomes what uh, is known as um, the position of Tujar Sultan. The, the, uh, the Jewish community become the appointed businessman 
of the Moroccan sovereign. Um, various chroniclers at the time, we have a very prominent uh, chronicler called um, uh, an, an, an Nasiri. Nasiri in the 19th century says that uh, he's very worried about the foreign businessmen that are in, that are in Morocco. He's wor about, worried about the effect it will have on the state of Islam in Morocco, etc., etc., etc. Uh, the Tujar al-Sultan uh, lease royal property. So um, in Sawera, for example, the shipping capital of Morocco at the time, they lease uh, the Sultan's properties and live there. The Malah is on Makhzan-owned land, again increasing um, proceeds to the Makhzan. And um, though it is somehow unsavoury to consider this in the modern, um, in the modern context, the, as Tujar al-Sultan, as the merchants of the Sultan, Moroccan's Jewish community were, were considered the property of the Sultan and they were moved accordingly. So if business needed to be improved in Tanja, then the Jewish community would be moved there. And you have um, various historical examples of the monopoly going um, from father to son. Um, there's